Welcome everyone, I'm Lisa Austin, director of the Bruce Gallery here in Northwestern Pennsylvania on the campus of Edinburgh University, where we are celebrating our 100th uh, year as an art program. Thanks to the generosity of the university, the department, Edinburgh's Student Government Association and Erie Arts and Culture, tonight's event is free and open to the public. We're recording and we will post the link at brucegallery.info. Now this event is the final installment in a five part series organized by the independent curator, Kololo Luckett. The title of the series is Illuminating the Collection and Illuminating the Collection is exactly what Kololo Luckett has been doing. Since last fall, she's been helping us at Edinburgh begin to take a careful look at a few of the 500 artworks stored here in Doucette Hall. The collection includes a few objects in clay, wood, fiber, bronze, along with photographs, posters, drawings, paintings, and collages. The majority of works though are prints, lithographs, woodcuts, silk screens, and etchings spanning three centuries. The collection was started about 70 years ago. Without major museums or galleries close by, the art faculty here decided to bring art to Edinburgh students. Over the decades, the work has largely remained in storage. The part-time directors here have been focused on organizing show after show in the gallery. However, the strange gift of COVID has created the space, the time, and funds to invite Kalola Luckett to guide us Edinburgh's faculty, staff, students, and alumni on a journey into our collection. Take it away, Kalolo. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's great to, to, to be um, here this evening, and um, we have some wonderful uh, guests here that um, we're going to be uh, speaking with these esteemed uh, artists, and um, they're all emerging artists. And when I say emerging artists, I always say that people that are still in school or at least 10 years, you know, and under out of school or self-taught. So, um, and a lot of the work that I do as a curator is I like to engage younger artists, younger generational art, younger gener. Uh, younger, gen, younger artists of a uh, younger, younger artists of a generation that is working during these times, especially um, during the pandemic, and really having an opportunity for artists to get to know each other that aren't in the same, that aren't sharing the same space. And so, by bringing on Mujani Merriweather, who is based in Baltimore, Maryland, who's actually right now in Los Angeles because she's in a group show and she can tell you a little bit about that. I wanted her to be in conversation with Madison Eggleston and also Anthony Ferris, who are both uh, graduate um, um, students at Edinburgh University. And so tonight is gonna be them presenting their work and talking about their work. And then we'll be in conversation and we'll be talking about our respective work and also will then engage the audience and they can um, ask questions. And I can just let you know that you can either put your questions or comments in the chat section below, or you can unmute yourself and you can ask your question when we are gonna be in our conversation um, in about, I guess, say 30 minutes. All right, so we're first going to start with Mujani, and I have just a little a bit of information I want to share about Mujani. I've known Mujani for, I feel like, all of her life, but it's only really been a few years. And I had the great uh, honor of curating a, 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 a group show with Mujani in it um, a few years ago at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center. Uh, and Amani uh, Mujani was in a, a show with Imani Lewis, and you all are part of a collective called the Colored Collective. And you all met at MICA, that's where you went to school, and you are doing something quite profound with sculpture. 
and is very, in, in, I feel like it's very innovative in how you're approaching sculpture and looking at traditional methods of, you know, sculpting the human form, but you're, 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 you're telling a story that is really encompassing um, stories that rarely get told. And, and you're really centering the black experience through your art making with working with clay. And so Rujani Merriweather is a sculptor based in Baltimore, Maryland. And she talks about mirroring the beautiful black culture and uplifts the black community through relatable portraits. From a young age, Mujani has used clay to mimic the features of black people that were seen as negative and celebrates them. Mujani is currently a second year resident at the Creative Alliance in Baltimore, which is a wonderful artist uh, um, studio space and gallery space that I was just recently there on a studio visit to, to see what you were up to Mujani. So um, if you can now um, unmute yourself and share your screen and um, we'll hear from you. So thank you. Awesome, thank you Kilolo and thank you everyone for having me here. I am so excited to be here and to show you guys my work. I'm gonna be sharing my screen. Can you guys see it okay? Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna just dive right into it. Uh, my name is Marjani Merriweather and I'm a sculptor based in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, so just a little background, I've been doing sculpture my whole life um, from eighth grade until now. And when I first started working in clay, it was something about it that was just very, it's gonna sound weird, but it just like felt nice to me. Just have, being hands on with something just felt amazing. And also I feel like growing up and actually learning about clay, I feel a little more grateful. And I feel like being able to make sculpture from the dirt, mm, excuse me, from the dirt is a blessing. And I wanna be able to take advantage of that blessing, obviously. So a little bit about my actual work. Uh, my work is about self-love of how we are and how we naturally come as black people. Um, my work also kind of talks about healing and what we do to heal and how we can heal as a people historically. And it also kind of, stands as a reflection to black spaces currently. Um, I want my pieces to be seen as like uh, something to celebrate. I want black people to see my pieces and say, hey, I'm art, I'm, I'm beautiful, I am worthy of being here. Um, I feel that in a lot of spaces, there are not many people of color or we're not portrayed in certain ways that we wanna be portrayed or we're not portrayed in certain ways that are relevant to today. Um, however, I do feel like the things that have happened to us historically are very important. I will say that I do want to push the narrative of self-love for ourselves. Um, obviously, there are a lot of artists who will make work about Black trauma, and I think that those things are very important. I think that those things that we need to know, and I think those are things that we need to be aware of. I personally love to make work that makes us feel good about ourselves and makes us want to be who we are. <laughs> um, so I tend to channel that through culture, like uh, celebrating different aspects of our culture. One of those things that I celebrate is grill culture. So this is Simi, this is my first, this is the catalyst of the grills pieces and I love him so much, he's huge. <laughs> um, and I actually made him while I was at Micah. Let me back up, I went to Micah from 2014, 2018, and I concentrated, I majored in ceramics and concentrated in film and video. We'll talk about the film and video later. It was just like one of those things that I wanted to do that was like, oh, I'm, I'm in school, why not learn something new? But I ended up falling in love with video as well. Um, so back to the girls, this is See Me, and I made this piece in response to how the media portrays black people and how I feel like for years, ever since the media was born, Black people have always been portrayed in this negative light. And usually the media is something that people learn from. We gain information from the media, whether it be news, TV, movies, magazines, whatever, books. We learn from these things. And I felt like because Black people were being portrayed in this negative light, people started to believe those things about us, which, are, which is not true. So I decided to take something small like grills 
And grills were actually seen as, in movies, they're kind of it's like a black person is wearing grills. They're seen, they're always portrayed as something negative. Like, oh my God, they're a drug dealer. They're this, they're that. Um, well, in actuality, like their teeth jewelry, it's just gold teeth. In history, like in ancient times, they used to actually wear grills and crystals in their mouths as a way to show wealth. So it used to be a positive thing, but now it's portrayed as something totally different. Now I would like to celebrate those things that we are proud of. So I have Simi here now who is, you know, fits the stereotype of what an intimidating black man may be, quote unquote, literally. And um, he's pulling his mouth apart so you can focus on what's on his insides rather than judging him on his outside. Now from there, I started focus, oops, I started focusing on grills in general. So to this day, I still work with grills. All these pieces, these three pieces were made this year and last year. Um, I started to focus more on expression. So I wanted to show how proud we were, how happy we were to be each other or to be ourselves. So the first one is Charlie, the bald girl, and she's smiling and she stands tall. The thing about her, like the way she's formed, her long neck, all of my sculptures have long neck to represent being proud of ourselves and standing tall and being, you know, cool with who we are, standing higher to God. Um, they actually do have that in African cultures as well, where they elongate their necks in order to be closer to God. And I just thought that was interesting as well. Um, but I still adorn my pieces with jewelry and makeup if you like makeup. <laughs> um, yeah, lashes. The second one is Zuri. Zuri was actually a piece that I also made for my mind as well. Um, this piece was fun because I really enjoyed his hair. <laughs> I felt like, I feel like hair is like a big part of our culture. And I'm going to get to that in the next slide, obviously, but hair is a huge part of our culture. The next one, the last one to the right is Pink Sifu. Now Pink Sifu is of an actual person. Pink Sifu is one of my friends. His name is, his real name is Liv. He's a rapper that goes by Pink Sifu. And I started to make people who resembled real people I wanted to make it relatable. I wanted to start making my pieces relatable and started to make my pieces seem like people that you have seen in, in real life to make it realistic. Um, so I'm really happy I made this piece of him. He's also super happy, but he actually, we had this conversation and he's like, you know, what you're doing is you're immort immortalizing black people. With ceramic, the ceramic doesn't die. The ceramic doesn't disintegrate. Ceramic is stone, it stays forever. Um, so I was just like, I just love the way he said that. And I was just like, yeah, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to use that. <laughs> so the next one, my next uh, part of what I do is I, the next culture that I celebrate is hair culture. And now hair culture has been a huge part of the black community. And I think mainly because it's kind of like our crowns and it's kind of like the way that we love ourselves and take care of ourselves. Um, so when I did these girls, these girls are actually, they're ceramic on the bottom. I sculpt them just, high, how, just like how I sculpt the sculptures in the last slide. And then um, I adhere braids on there. Now the thing about the braids is that they're hand braided by me. Some of them are dyed. Um, like I dyed, the, like the pink one, her hair color is dyed. Um, and the, the reason why I hand braid them instead of just buying regular bought braids is because the process of my pieces are very important to me. The process to me is more of a, um, is more of a healing process. It's more of taking my time to get to my own self healing. All of my pieces are personal to me. They're all a piece of me. And I feel like that's how artists are in general. When we make work, it is a piece of us. It's not just something that we're just willy nilly throwing around. <laughs> like, it's like how we communicate sometimes. So all of my pieces, like these are my girls, I call them my girls, like all of my pieces have pronouns. Like, I want to give them respect, just like how I respect myself. And that is also my form of self-love. Um, but these girls is, they're, the braided girls are mainly just a celebration of hair and different hair types and how we would like to wear our hair. And I know you guys are looking at me like, oh my God, this girl is bald. I also do a lot of sculptures with bald girls. And I like to talk about the dynamic of either you want to celebrate your hair or you can go against the stereotype of what it is to be a woman without hair. And I like to talk about those two things as well. Um, and you should be able to wear your hair the way you want to wear. For me personally, I enjoy wearing my hair short because I feel like 
I'm going against the stereotypical norms of what it is to be a black woman. I have to wear my hair a certain way in order to feel, in order to fit in somewhere. When in actuality, being bald makes me feel comfortable. It is also my form of self-love and me forcing myself to be, to be comfortable with how I am without having to hide behind my hair. There are also women who love their hair and their hair is their crown. And I feel like that is perfectly okay. And I wanna celebrate that as well. So I also like to focus on process, but I also like to focus on detail. <laughs> I love little details in my pieces. I love the colors that they that the hair strands make when you put them together. Um, the middle piece is actually of inspired by my friend Blue. Her real name is Denicia Baker. And so the piece is her name is Denicia. And uh, I put the butterfly on her ear to represent her. My friend Denicia, she loves butterflies. She feels like it's her way to be free. And I wanted to honor that in the same way that I honored the color blue because her nickname is blue and everybody calls her blue. <laughs> um, so I just love little details like that that also add personality to each piece. I don't want my pieces to be seen as just an object because I make pieces that are humanizing that I want to humanize the culture of black people. So I have to make pieces that are personal and humanizing. <laughs> um, and then, so I also wanted to talk about this going. Kind of froze, sorry guys. I also wanted to talk about my process. Oh my gosh. I also wanted to talk about my process. And I was just explaining earlier how my process is such an important part of my practice. And a lot of the times people don't see that process. And I understand that artists kind of get into it and we just don't decide to record sometimes. And I forget to record sometimes too. And I've actually talked to Kilolo about documenting myself more and I'm working on doing my best with that. But I also wanted to dabble more into the video aspect of things. Cause I told you guys, I did a concentration in film and video as well. Um, but it's just something about historically documenting my process and documenting I think it's a reflection of how I, where I am mentally and showing respect to where I was and my growth in between. So this is a very short, yes guys, I'm on TikTok, <laughs> a very short video of just a little process video of this piece. So here it is. This how we make people all around the world fall in love. Well, I got a call just the other day Telling me where you been, where you been, where you say It's too busy in the club At the bar, at the bar So that's my short little video. Um, I try to treat my pieces as if they're actual people. And I'm like, girl, let me take your, let me take your pictures <laughs> and have fun with them. Um, but yeah, I love my girls. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you guys for listening to me. And please let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. And thank you guys for inviting me here. I feel really special. <laughs> Thank you, Mujani. And people can follow you on Instagram at yes. MVR. Instagram or Twitter, MVRJONI. And then my website is the same thing, but .com. And then my Facebook is literally the same thing. <laughs> it's all the same. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. All right. So next up is Madison. And let me share a little information about Madison. Uh, Madison Eggleston is an Akron, Ohio native where she grew up surrounded by an artist community and began making art at a very young age. Uh, by age 16, she was teaching pottery classes and in 2019 received her bachelor's of fine arts and jewelry, medals and enameling from Kent State University and Kent um, Ohio. Back in Akron, uh, she went on to work in the nationally renowned art space, Don Drum Studios and Gallery. Amid a global pandemic, Eggleston uh, accepted a graduate assistantship at Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania, where she currently studies under Sue M M Amendorala. Amendolora. Amendolora, thank you. And Cappy Cunard. Mm -hmm. 
Um, when she's not in her studio, Madison can be found outdoors exploring nature or playing with her cat, Evie. Evie. <laughs> Evie. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Madison, for um, joining us this evening. And where are you currently located? Uh, I'm currently in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm actually in my studio right now. Awesome. All right. Uh, I'll just share my screen. All right. Can you guys all see that? Yep. Looks good. Okay. So hi, everyone. I'm Madison. Um, these are pictures of me, but um, I'm an artist and I'm a metalsmith. I'm from Akron, Ohio. Um, I went to Kent State University and I'm here to talk about it. So, okay, hi. So I like to include these pictures always because it is very important to me to acknowledge the people who have made everything possible. So on the left-hand side is my high school art teacher, Sandy Fox. She was the best. I would literally have never even considered art without her. And on the left is Andrew Kubek. He was my undergraduate department head. He taught me everything that I know about metal. I had a significant amount of catching up to do because I was a ceramics major at first. Hoping to add a very cute picture of me and Cappy and Sue from Edinburgh as soon as possible. Um, so um, I did my undergraduate at Kent State. I began as a ceramics major and then I switched to metals. So I had a lot of catching up to do and I really didn't consider my work conceptually until I was a senior and doing my BFA thesis. So these are two of my four thesis pieces. On the left is a piece called being grounded used to be a bad thing. And on the right, it's called, um, it's not cool to miss your mom. My thesis explored jewelry as a, a protective device. Being grounded used to be a bad thing is a piece meant to help the viewer feel grounded and structured. Uh, it came from my experiences living with ADHD. And um, I kind of like drew reference from the saying head in the clouds. So, I don't know. The, it was supposed to be a piece that comforted the wearer. Uh, I think a lot of us experience anxiety as well. Uh, on the left, it's called It's Not Cool to Mr. Mom. It is a piece about my struggles with homesickness and um, my desire to be at home and be with my family as much as possible. Uh, however, that obviously is not uh, something that you can do if you're trying to get a degree. So the pieces are soft and plush and they're comforting. They're in a fabric that uh, was very familiar to me and the shapes just are comforting. However, when you wear it, it does impede your motion. So these are the other two from my undergraduate thesis. Uh, there's a little less to talk about here. The one on the left is called Totally Not Depressed. Through color theory, theory and special occasion fabric, it brings a sense of warmth and joy to the wearer. Uh, just meant to be worn in depressed times. And the piece on the right is called I Feel So Freaking Pretty and explores the way that sometimes people feel confidence from covering up and other times they feel that from sort of vulnerability and nakedness. I did take a gap year as um, was mentioned previously. I worked at Don Drum Studios in Akron. I think not every job is a job that you want to do for the rest of your life. And I'm grateful for my time there, my time working with them. It helped me to realize that I don't want to just work at a gallery. I want to be the gallery. I want to be in it. So that's what I needed to apply to grad school at Edinburgh. So I'm going to be very honest with you all. I got to Edinburgh and I was immediately just hit with this creative slump. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. So I made this like body of candy jewelry. And I, it's controversial in the department to this day. I don't like it. I'm not proud of it. Other people will say I shouldn't be too hard on myself, but regardless, it does not contribute to my body of work. But I acknowledge its um, importance because it may not hold a formal weight, but that doesn't negate that it helped me process and become familiar here and begin making some very serious work. So this brooch is what I call a supple brooch. It's the very first of a line that has, I think, upwards of 20 brooches at this point, and I plan to continue. Um, I, when I made it, I didn't have any conceptual weight to it yet. However, 
all I just remember is feeling so thankful that I was out of the slump, that I knew what I was doing and that my work had found direction again. This is the second supple brooch that I was working on. I still hadn't really considered the whys as far as concept, but I began to understand formally that I enjoy working with repeated forms. Um, it should also be noted, I work extremely fast. So the candy series had nine pieces total and was finished by October 5th, 2020. This piece was finished by the 20th of October, 2020. So I always intended to make a lot of these and I continue to make them to this day. This is the third, it's the only one that isn't a circle. At this point, I was still just working out uh, like the technical kinks of working with powder coat, which is a plastic coating that goes over metal. So it does break sometimes. Okay, I finally started exploring concept. So I knew that I wanted my work to be about beauty, perception and attention, but I was not quite able to work through what that meant yet. So I identified these things, I started exploring. The first, uh, this piece references female beauty standards. The forms on the front were, um, they were like vector images I traced and then cut out of stretch marks. The back is fuzzy. Um, I didn't, I decided I didn't like that. So I moved on. I went for a more, I guess, academic view of fat and femininity. So. I made um, the shapes on the front were sawn out using vectors of a like cross cut of a fat cell. And then I had a committee meeting shortly after and the question was asked for the first of many, many times, uh, why the amoeba shape on the back? Why that squiggle? And just like a little spoiler alert, I have no idea still. So this was the first significant piece that I made in grad school. I had finally moved on, I had sort of started to come up with uh, direction. So I decided that people dress how, people dress in a way that will either hide their flaws or accentuate their attributes. I was considering the weirdness and overt sexual nature of clothing and the way it's gendered. So I made this piece called Meaty Glamour. I was looking to abstract a hot dog. I wanted to reference a phallus and I wanted to make it feminine, but have it still be fun. So these forms are soft and pink. The back is fuzzy. The piece is also an exploration of connections. I made the chain in a different way than I typically do. I was also looking to drag queens as I made this piece and the following piece um, in terms of fabric and color. So this piece is a sister to meaty glamour called Fatty and Fancy. The conceptual weight is similar. Uh, it was the last piece I made before I took a holiday, um, a two month hiatus from making art to focus on my health. I had carpal tunnel, my hands were very sore all the time. So when I got back for the beginning of this semester, I kind of was back at the beginning, I was creatively blocked again. So I just went back to making brooches, but tried using more intentional imagery in different shapes. This was just a continuation of that, trying to get my footing again. Um, I was putting stronger emphasis on craftsmanship and details. This brooch, I applied technical concepts from other pieces to give it more layers. I also by hand sought out each of these tiny pieces. So there's much more, um, there's more to look at visually. Throughout all of this, I was also looking to expand beyond necklaces and brooches. I don't know if any of you noticed, but I've never made anything other than that. Um, that really held any formal weight. So I made this ring for a ring competition. And then the night before I realized that there was a size requirement and I had made a size 11 ring and I could only make a 10. So I made a new one and that's this one that you're seeing on this slide. But it was really exciting. I think that this is what got me back into the spirit of making. So at the same time as the rings, I was kind of working on this piece, but I was able to identify a concept. I wanted to make work that gave the wearer the ability to communicate how they were perceived. This piece is called All Seen. It is a reference to the all seeing eye that seeks to expose the secrets we carry with us. Seen in the title is spelled seen as in seen from a movie, um, S-C-E-N-E. -E but it's so performative. The piece is about the act of putting on a visual concrete facade on our bodies to protect the intangible bits that lie within. I went to an artist talk one night from a painter and hearing him speak of his work uh, was just so different from how metalsmiths talk about their work. And it kind of had, I had a paradigm shift. I realized that my work can be what I want. 
And it really, I like, I literally control the narrative. So I made this piece called Requiem for the Lost. Um, it's a place of mourning for the parts of us that are lost to this facade that I've been talking about. Um, I think when we hide parts of ourselves long enough, things just get lost. And I think at this point, I was also dealing, I've always dealt with being taken seriously as a metalsmith. Uh, women are not. <laughs> I The field has a lot of women in it because of the jewelry aspect, but um, there's definitely like a hierarchy. I'm very used to being talked about in the little lady sort of way by my male colleagues. So I made this piece to sort of protect the feminine parts of me that I shoved down in order to fit in in my field. And this is one of my extremely new pieces. I finished it just like a week ago. It's called Cloud Fine, and it's a play on words from Head in the Clouds and Cloud Nine again, a uh, feeling of joy. Um, Head in the Clouds is a pinnacle of shallow thoughtlessness, and I had worked with that concept before. Um, as I've said, I had ADHD, and I always just thought it was funny that the assumption was that somehow I'm both dumb and constantly daydreaming and thinking. So it's a commentary on the way that depth and intelligence are often ignored when something is um, feminine or beautiful. At this point, all of my work is about utilizing selective attention-seeking qualities and our physical appearance to direct attention where we want it so that uh, the person wearing the piece is able to control, I guess, how they're perceived in their narrative, like they can make their own story. And this is my very most recent piece. I just finished this like days ago. Um, it's called Day Screamer. It is a continuation of Cloud Fine. Um, it's actually a knuckle duster. It's a little tricky to tell that in the picture. I'm still kind of working on the photographs with humans, but it is a conjunction with Cloud Fine. It's to convey frustration and I guess anger with the necessity of having to hide parts of yourself um, in order to be taken seriously or gain validity. Um, I'm working with contrasting elements, like soft, cutesy kind of cloud shapes and imagery, but combined with something harsh, like a brass knuckle. And then it's another layer of juxtaposition because it's a brass knuckle, it's meant for punching or hitting someone, but it's a cloud, so it's soft. And then there's the additional layer of, it is actually, it's copper, it's annealed copper, so it's very hard. And that kind of brings us up to speed. At the beginning, my cat was also mentioned. So I just paid the cat, cat tax really quick for you all so you could see it. And that is the end of my presentation. Thanks everybody for being here. We are recording this, so it'll be up in a, in a few days. I want to also just uh, note that I point, put in the text sculpturex.org and um, they are uh, have a deadline of uh, May 18th to apply to uh, give a talk uh, at the Sculpture X uh, event, which is being held in Pittsburgh in September. And then also anybody who considers themselves a three-dimensional artist has an opportunity to be in a show at Chatham. These are both on the website and um, it's a $12 fee and all the fees go to awards. So uh, that's uh, the deadline for that is in August. So it's all online. Thanks for being here tonight, Kalola. Thanks so much for everything that you're doing. And uh, good night, everybody. Bye, Dr. Wellman. <laughs>